Our goal in this first video in predicate logic is to make some sense of subjects and predicates. So we know from the intro video that we can have this sen sentence, Frisky is a cat, and we have a subject and a predicate, and the predicate is telling us properties about the subject. So we're going to sort of zoom in here on the first sort of simpler case, where subjects are individuals, and we're not talking about the all cats example, we're just talking about a singular uh, individual cat. In this case, Frisky, but it doesn't really matter. And so what we're using in these types of examples is something called a name. So a name is a really important thing for us, and we just sort of use it in the most sort of standard way that we know. A name is something that picks out an individual thing. So here are examples of names, Aristotle and Plato. Now, for us, we're going to have special name letters, which are lowercase a through h, which are going to use in abbreviation schemes to pick out an individual. So whenever you see the lowercase a through h, you know that it's a name letter, and it will represent something or someone. Now remember, names can be more than just individual people. They can be things in general. So here are some examples, CN Tower, 5, the fifth planet from the sun. I don't think CN Tower is controversial. Uh, some people might be like, why is 5 a name? You know, is 5 really an actual individual thing? Uh, well, that's sort of like a deep philosophical question. Uh, if you're interested in this, you probably have to take philosophy of mathematics, which I happen to teach. Option C here, the fifth planet from the sun, I'm just pointing out that we're using the word the to uh, identify an individual thing, and this is called some uh, a definite description, and uh, we can use that all the time to actually pick out something without naming it what its name in general. So for example, you could say the professor of PHL 245 instead of saying Alex Koo, and that would uh, identify the same person. So there's nothing sort of wrong with that when we want to use a name. So we're going to assume a couple important things when we invoke a name. Now none of this is too controversial, uh, and they have sort of this like history and logic, which I'll briefly mention. But the first thing I'm going to assume is that if we use a name, it must be the case that that thing that we name really exists. So here are examples of names that I'm sort of using. Uh, a is representing Bilbo Baggins, and D is the present king of France. And we're going to say that these are bad examples. We can't actually name these things because these things don't exist. Bilbo Baggins isn't actually a real thing, and there is no present king of France. Uh, you might recognize this last example from being famous uh, from Bertrand Russell, but we're not going to really talk too much about the, the sort of like history of this problem. We're just going to remember that we can safely assume that a named thing exists. We're also going to make a sort of convenient assumption here, and we're going to say that names are not ambiguous. So if I say Simone, we sort of have a problem. There's lots of Simones out there in the world, and it's, it's unclear who I'm really talking about. And so we can say, well, maybe context makes it clear, whatever, but we're just actually not even going to worry about that problem. We're just going to pretend that when I invoke a name, it's uh, not ambiguous at all. I'm just pointing to a particular individual, and we all know who that person is. So this is sort of just a convenient assumption so we don't have to worry about these problems when we're actually just interested in crunching the logic. Okay, so when we look at this Frisky as a cat, we now understand how to represent Frisky. Frisky is a subject, which is a name, and now we need to sort of shift over and just start to make sense of how we can symbolize predicates. So there's uh, two key types of predicates. There's single-place predicates and multi-place predicates. So we'll start with single-place, and some people call these monadic predicates. Uh, a single-place predicate just tells us about one subject, and like I said earlier, it's about the property of that subject. And so we're going to use, again, uh, letters to denote this, because what we're doing is we're developing our syntax for symbolization, and we'll use capital letters A through O to be our predicate letters. So here's an example. This isn't the finished example of how predicates look, but this is just to sort of help get, uh, us get a basic idea of what's going on. So I could have capital A be the predicate, blank is a cat, and capital B is the predicate, blank is a dog. And you can sort of see how this works here. If you put a name letter in there, then you're saying that name is a cat or that name is a dog and so on. So that's what we'll be doing. We're not focused on multiplace predicates in this unit. We're going to worry about multiplace or polyadic predicates uh, in a sort of future unit, but I'm going to introduce it now just to sort of talk a little bit about notation. So multiplace predicates relate or talk about or bestow properties for multiple subjects. So here I have blank drives blank to blank. 
But you can sort of see that this is sort of awkward to talk about because I'd have to be like, oh, the first blank or the second. And, you know, it's a bit unclear notation wise. So we're going to adopt a sort of more formal notation in general. The first thing is we're going to have a superscript with a number that will tell us how many places of the predicate we're talking about, so how many slots it has. And we're also going to use this sort of like set notation with a one, set notation with a two, set notation with a three, so that we can easily point to the slots or the places in a predicate. When we look at a single place predicate, uh, you can see that we have the superscript of one, and we always just have one slot because it's a single place place predicate, and so we come up with this notation. So this notation is the notation that you would in general want to use when you're creating some sort of symbolization scheme of predicates. Uh, and only a subject can go in the predicate slot there, so and whenever we, we have the set notation with the one, some sort of subject must go in there. For convenience, and just so it looks a little bit smoother, because we're only doing single place predicates in this unit, I'm just going to sort of drop those superscripts for now, uh, just so it's a little cleaner looking. This doesn't really matter. If you want to have your superscripts in your abbreviation schemes, you're more than welcome to. Okay, so we have the basic understanding of the syntax for a subject and a predicate. How do we put it together? How do I symbolize Frisky is a cat, given that capital A is my predicate for is a cat, and lowercase a is the name letter that identifies Frisky? Uh, well, it's pretty straightforward. It's as I sort of suggested earlier, we would symbolize this by saying capital A, little a. So the capital A is the predicate and it has a single slot. And we just put in that single slot the subject that we're concerned with, in this case, the letter for Frisky. And that's how we symbolize Frisky is a cat. So some other basic examples, how do I symbolize Frisky is not a cat? Well, here are two seemingly reasonable options. I can put the negation in front of the predicate, or I can put the negation in front of the name letter, which denotes Frisky. So remember, the only thing that you can put into a predicate is a subject. So we can't actually put logical connectives or anything. Uh, so even though the bottom one sort of looks okay, it seems sort of weird. It's saying something like, the negation of Frisky is a cat. But that doesn't really make any sense. Like, what is the negation of Frisky? You know, we don't have a not of a person. Uh, that, that doesn't really uh, have some sort of natural interpretation. But if we look at the top one, it says it's not the case that Frisky is a cat, because we already know capital A, small a, says Frisky is a cat. So that's the right way to do it. And we no don't want to put extra things into the predicates other than individuals. So for Frisky and Mosley are cats, how do we do it? Uh, again, we have two plausible options. I can say AA and AB, or I can say A and then put some parentheses up and say A and B. Again, the bottom one sort of seems reasonable. I'm saying Frisky and Mosley are sitting in the predicate is a cat, so they are cats. Uh, but this violates our sort of basic syntax, which is we, can, we don't want logical connectives and other things in our predicate. So we're going to say the bottom one is no good, and we're going to do it the top way. Now, I haven't formalized this at all. I'm really just introducing this, and we're going to formalize it soon. So uh, don't worry if I've moved over this quickly. We're going to just come back and, and, and write out our rules for syntax and symbolization shortly. Okay, so uh, predicates with names, that's what we've covered so far. Logical connectives, they work outside, and predicate places uh, only contain those, those subjects, so like we just saw. So now we got to look at uh, predicates with groups. So what's the difference between symbolizing all cats are evil versus like some sort of individual named cat? So this is where things get tricky. Again, in this video, I'm just sort of introducing a lot of these concepts, and we'll go over the technical details uh, later on. So what we're looking to introduce is the concept of quantification. Quantification allows us to talk about a quantity of a particular subject. So I can say all of a subject or some of a subject. Now, you might think there's other sort of important quantities out there that we will be, want to be able to express, but it turns out that our system will be powerful enough to express all the quantities that we could want just in virtue of all, some, and of course, we'll use negation as well. That'll be an important sort of way to symbolize other quantities. So for now, let's focus on all of a subject. What we need is a new symbol, and we're going to introduce 
the universal quantifier. And the universal quantifier will be the tool that lets us talk about all or signify that we're talking about all of a particular subject. The symbol for this is this upside down A you see here. Similarly, I'm going to need a uh, symbol for sum of a subject, and we're going to call this the existential quantifier. So the existential quantifier is here, and it's just the backwards E. These are very common notation. There are other notations for these things that you'll see in other, particularly older textbooks, uh, but the universal uh, and the existential, as demonstrated here, are, are, are pretty sort of standard usage today. Okay, so how do I symbolize all cats are evil? So here I have uh, a new abbreviation scheme, B, uh, is a cat and F is evil. Those are both predicates. Notice I don't have any name letters here because there are no names in this statement, so I don't need one. Well, our first crack at this isn't going to sort of go so well. I could use the universal with the capital B, and I'm saying for all B, so for all cats, but that's not quite right because I know that I'm supposed to have some sort of subject in with the predicate, so there's sort of something missing here. Uh, and what's missing is something really important. Uh, so how can I say all cats? Well, all cats, it's just all Bs, right? B is the predicate letter a cat. But what I really need is some sort of way to talk about a generic thing, a generic subject that doesn't have a name. I don't want to have to name every single cat in the universe, like Frisky and Mosley, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That would take forever. Well, more than forever. So I need a way to express this blank as a generic subject. And so what we need is something called a variable. A variable is really just going to express this sort of blank that can be filled in. And in our system, variable letters are going to be letters I through Z. Just as sort of a note, I would generally use the tail end of the variable letters, uh, but it doesn't really matter. If you wanted to use IJK, you for sure can. So now we know what I'm going to say is all things be X, where X I know is a variable letter. And now I can sort of move on and formalize this to replace the all with my universal quantifier. So when I want to say something like all cats, it's going to look like this. For all x, bx. And what that's really saying is, for anything that is this sort of generic thing, uh, that thing x is a cat, which is a really long-winded way of saying all cats. So how do we say all cats are evil? Well, now we know all cats is for all x, bx. And how do I say are evil? Well, I know that I want to say all things are evil, so I can say something like for all x, fx. But again, we have some sort of problem here. Even if you're sort of following along and being like, OK, I see why all x, uh, fx sort of makes sense, uh, it doesn't really relate to these two things. On the one hand, I'm saying all cats. And I'm, on the other hand, I'm saying all evils, but I'm not really saying all cats are evil. So there's something missing in this. And what's missing is that we really just need a more robust syntax and a better understanding of the meaning of the quantifiers and how they work. And once we are armed with those tools, we'll be able to symbolize pretty much everything that we want in single place predicate logic. So just to recap, this video was really just a soft introduction to the core things that we need to add to our system to do predicate logic in a single place. We need name letters, variable letters, predicate letters, and we need quantifiers. So what we're missing is a really better understanding of these things, and that we'll start covering in a sort of very technical detail in our next video where we go over the syntax and we go over a really important concept called scope.